Hello, I'm Adria Breyer, and welcome to the Commonwealth Program with Dr. Dale Bredesen. Before I introduce him, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Commonwealth. They are committed to open dialogue showing all sides of a topic from international experts in every field you could imagine. So we bring you the most current, most important information, and we have hundreds of programs every month. You're currently at the beginning of what's known as the member engagement experience. And at the end of this first hour, members will be able to join Dr. Bredesen in a private, more intimate setting and ask questions directly. You can become a member for $110 a year, which is mind boggling because you can give memberships as gifts for weddings, birth announcements, anything you can possibly think of, because frankly, we all have enough stuff. But to give the gift that allows us to be in community and have dialogue with people and be continually learning what's important, I suggest you look at the membership. Dr. Bredesen, you are one of my heroes. I truly believe you deserve to be in the no rail prize line. You have gone outside of the box on what we've been told is terminal and it is not. So I am very, very grateful that you are here. I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction now. Please don't get embarrassed of, you know, what your background is. Dr. Bredesen graduated from Caltech and received his MD from Duke. He trained with Nobel laureate Professor Stanley Prusner. He was the founding president of the well-known, highly respected Buck Institute for Research on Aging. His research led to over 230 published papers on diseases that we were told could not go backwards and people couldn't get their lives back. He also, the first reversal of cognitive, showed the first reversal of cognitive decline in patients with Alzheimer's disease by using precision medicine protocol. He's the author of two New York Times bestsellers, a senior director of the world's first precision medicine program for neurodegenerative diseases, which is at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute. I need to make two more comments. I love Dr. Bredesen that you said Alzheimer's is optional. Thank you for that hope. And one of the people who you cured, um, well, that's a whole other story. You'll talk about that. But this woman, Sally said of her grandmother, grandma is back. I cannot tell you how touching that was. So Dr. Bredesen, take it away. I'm really, really grateful you agreed to my request to speak and on this topic. Thank you very much, Adria. Happy New Year to everyone. And thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, the, the, I'm honored to be talking to the Commonwealth Club group. Uh, it's a you know it's a very famous group, and and I and I am uh, I'm, I'm proud and honored to to be involved. Uh, and this couldn't be a better time with this beginning of 2024. This is an exciting time. And as I'll show you, Alzheimer's is moving from the dark ages where we had nothing to offer, where we didn't understand how the disease worked, where people would just get it. And it's many, many people that actually dwarfs the pandemic to a period where we're now entering a golden age, where we're, we have new blood tests, we have new approaches, we have many, many people now that are reversing their cognitive decline and doing quite well. And we'll talk about why that is today. So with today we're gonna to talk as Adrian invited me to speak about women in Alzheimer's because this is something often we hear about Alzheimer's this, Alzheimer's that, but it's not often that someone simply says, look, let's talk about women in Alzheimer's. What's, what's the issue here? Because as you probably know, um, it is much more common in women, about twice as common in women as it is in men. As Maria Shriver has pointed out, this is really a woman-centric disease. About 65% of the patients, about 60% of the caregivers. But what I want to tell you today is shocking that if you look at all the research, you look at all the results we have, it's really now becoming optional. And so really in the future, people will not have to worry about this. I tell our daughters who are both in their 30s, uh, you are the first generation that will not have to fear Alzheimer's disease because there is so much that can now be done. So let me move forward here. 
I mentioned the 65% of patients and 60% of caregivers. So unfortunately, very, very common problem, more so in women. It is unfortunately more common than breast cancer even. So a very common problem. And as you've probably heard, there have been recently approved drugs. Um, they have virtually no value uh, for women. So it's 11% uh, slowing. There's no improvement on cognition. And that's something that's often missed. People don't recognize, well, wait a minute. All they're talking about is you still decline, but you decline 11% slower if you're a woman. So that's a problem. There's no real stabilization. And of course, there are some very significant side effects, such as brain bleeding and brain swelling, and in a few cases, death, unfortunately. Unfortunately, this disease, Alzheimer's, dwarfs the pandemic. We've had well over a million Americans now die from the, the pandemic, from COVID-19. Uh, and Alzheimer's will claim, of the currently living Americans, it will claim about 45 million of us. Um, it is an extremely common cause of death. And actually, in the UK now, it has become the number one cause of death in women. So a huge global problem that we've been attacking for years. So the obvious question is, why? Why is this such a problem? And there are many contributors to this, and we'll talk about why that is. But just to summarize some of these, the first thing is menopause versus andropause. And so in menopause, you have a relatively rapid decline in hormones, which, by the way, is one of the reasons that it may be possible that in some of these uh, studies, uh, people who actually used bioidentical hormone replacement therapy around the time of menopause did better. Uh, it was a wonderful study from Stanford that showed that, for example. With andropause, we men also have a drop off in our hormones, but it, it goes more slowly over the years. And that may be one of the important reasons that sudden change seems to be bad for your brain. Estradiol has a very important function. There are actually estradiol receptors in the brain. It is important for learning and memory. And so when there's that sudden drop off, you can see a reduction in learning and memory. Now, for many people, that comes back, but for some, it does not, and it can continue on. And by the way, one of the most common problems now is early onset Alzheimer's. By definition, that means at less than 65 years old. But what we see is you know, when I was training way back in the 1980s, we never saw people in their 40s or 50s with Alzheimer's. It was considered to be a disease of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Now it's one of the most common things we see. 52-year-old woman going through menopause who now starts to have problems with learning and memory and who ends up being diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Something has changed. And in fact, the epidemiologists have published the same thing. The greatest percentage increases have been in the 40s and 50s. The other thing is we now can see it coming much better than before, just as happened with diabetes. You know, many years ago, it was thought you had diabetes or you didn't have diabetes. Now we know about pre-diabetes. We know about pre-pre-diabetes where people have insulin resistance. So just as we were able to now to see the steps leading up to full-on diabetes, we have the same story. We're seeing the steps that lead for many years. When you get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, you can see changes for about 20 years ahead of that. So again, what we used to think of as a disease of our 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s is really turning out to be a disease of our 30s, 40s, 50s that just gets diagnosed much later. And progresses over time. So we have these minor changes that our doctors tell us, ah, oh, don't worry, that's just normal aging, but we really should be looking into these much more carefully. And this is one of the things we'll talk about today to make sure that as few of the people who are on currently as possible will ever get this disease. My hope would be that nobody listening to this today will ever get Alzheimer's disease, will ever have to worry about this and truly develop dementia. And that will mean 
getting in early, getting on prevention, or getting on as early a treatment as possible. So estradiol is one of the things. Progesterone, what does progesterone do? Well, one of the things that is supported by progesterone happens to be your ability to deal with toxins. So as we're exposed to these various toxins, we begin to lose some of the ability to get rid of them. And therefore, another reason for as we drop are dropping our progesterone for dropping uh, our resistance to Alzheimer's disease. One of the things, as you know, that happens in people in the long run is osteoporosis. So what happens with osteoporosis, you have this beautiful balance prior to menopause where you have osteoblastic activity. Those are the little cells that are making the bone. Then you have osteoclastic activity. Those are the little cells that are actually picking up the bone. They're actually bigger cells than the osteoblast. They're picking up the bone. They're eating it. And so you, when these are in balance, it's beautiful. It's just like you, so you have a groups that are always working on your house, making it nicer, adding a little here, taking this, changing this, a little new paint, a new, a new couch, you know, this, that, and the other. You're always making it nicer, nicer, nicer. Now imagine that for years, the side of actually making the bone didn't work. And imagine the side of picking up the bone worked extra hard. So now you'd see now with the house, the house gets smaller, smaller, smaller. And so that's what's happening with osteoporosis. Now, what happens is as the bones are losing some of their content, they are releasing sequestered toxins. One of the things that we do when we are exposed to these various things, and this can be air pollution, this can be cosmetics, this can be uh, metal, uh, things like mercury, this can be mold-related toxins. There are all sorts of toxins we're exposed to. We deal with them pretty well for much of our lives. But as our progesterone goes down. And as we now start to release these things, because one of the things we do is we sequester these things in our bones. Great. They're not toxic when they're sitting in the bones. Now the bones are starting to change. They're now releasing this. So what happens, you now go through this period where you have increased exposure from an endogenous source of these toxins. And you go through what's called the osteoclastic burst, which lasts about seven years. And during that time, you have this increased exposure. Again, a reason for, for uh, optimizing your detox. And then pregnenolone, which actually is good for the brain, supportive of the brain. Uh, and one of the things that happens is our pregnenolone goes down, especially if we're under stress. Pregnenolone goes down. I found this actually in checking myself a number of years ago. My pregnenolone was quite low. Yes, I went through an internship and residency, you know, lots of stress, staying up 24 7 for many, many years did not help. So the, your pregnenolone is coming from your, uh, from your adrenal glands and it can go lower. And then of course, autoimmunity and inflammation. A lot of Alzheimer's is about two major things. Energetics, do you have enough energetic support for your brain, blood flow, oxygenation, which is why we worry if people have sleep apnea, mitochondrial function, the mitochondria are the batteries basically of your cells. Um, ketone levels, all of these things are good for supporting your brain. If that's too low, that's not a good thing. The other part is inflammation. And so inflammation is taxing your brain. And, and the interestingly, the, the pathology of Alzheimer's, the amyloid that is part of the Alzheimer's pathology is actually part of your body's defense against these various things. So when you have inflammation, when you get exposed to these various pathogens, for, for example, uh, bacteria from your mouth, uh, leaky gut, uh, if you're getting tick bites, things like this, these can all give you pathogens. And that inflammation is unfortunately also contributing. Now, you probably know autoimmunity, where you're now reacting against something in your own body, is, an, is another source of inflammation. And autoimmunity is more common in women than it is in men. That's why, for example, there's much more lupus in women than there is in men. And it's one of the reasons that there is probably more, uh, or probably one of the reasons that there is an, indeed more Alzheimer's in women than in men. And then, of course, 
stress and anxiety. Uh, you know, it's as we as we've heard time and time again, there there's a lot of stress and anxiety out there for all of us. Um, it doesn't help uh, if you're not getting paid the same as your male counterpart. You know that that is these things are all contributory. On the positive side women are less likely to have sleep apnea. Um, we men uh, have much more sleep apnea, and that is a contributor to our cognitive decline. So there are a number of reasons why women do tend to get Alzheimer's more than men, and these are just some of them. All right, so it's important to understand that medicine is undergoing an upheaval right now. There are fundamental changes. Anyone who's gone into, into your doctor recently knows that medicine has a lot of issues, sometimes very short times to see patients, sometimes overcharging, sometimes uh, the doctor sitting facing away from you and typing away at the computer. Uh, medicine needs an upgrade, and the biggest problem is that medicine is very good at dealing with 20th century problems. When I trained way back in the 70s and 80s, um, we can write a prescription uh, if you have uh, pneumococcal pneumonia. We can write a prescription if you have tuberculosis. But what's happened now is we've gotten rid of a lot of these infectious illnesses and even had some, some fairly decent success against HIV, which was much tougher, but there's been a lot of success. A lot of people living very successfully, having been treated very successfully with HIV. And even, of course, uh, with SARS-CoV-2. So even with COVID, COVID has slowly mutated. People aren't dying at the rates that they did before. The problem is these are fundamentally different diseases than when you look at complex chronic illnesses, Alzheimer's, vascular disease, ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, cancers, lupus, all of these things are fundamentally different. It's not one little simple organism. You write a prescription, that organism is killed. It doesn't work that way. And as I'll show you today, you have to change your thinking because these are changes in networks that involve these cells. So unfortunately, what's happened is just what I'm showing here. Uh, the Titanic of mainstream medicine uh, is being sunk by the iceberg of chronic illness. And so people go in and they just don't get good, uh, effective approaches. They don't get cured when you go in for these various things, unfortunately. Now, things are getting better, um, but we have to start looking at these. And I'll show you, Alzheimer's is a classic example. There has been virtually no success with simple prescription pad medicine. And there's been a lot of success with looking at the whole network of changes and addressing those things. So that's where medicine is headed. Okay, so it's a sad state of affairs, as I said, and I'll show you why. So if you have problems today and you go into a standard physician, uh, here's the problem. So first of all, they encourage the patients to wait. They say, oh, it's probably not Alzheimer's, and they typically treat only in the late stages. Of course, we want to do better and better and better with that. Uh, and, you know, we have someone like poor, you know, Bruce Willis, where people were aware for years that something wasn't quite right. Now, of course, he turned out to have frontotemporal dementia, not Alzheimer's disease. Nevertheless, this is a neurodegenerative condition and kind of waiting, waiting, waiting until very late stages. So we all need to do better getting on active prevention and earliest treatment. When you go into the doctor then with a problem with your cognition, they get very small data sets. They don't really attempt to identify the underlying drivers. They don't ask what's causing this. They just say, it's Alzheimer's. We don't know what causes it. Sorry, we're going to give you a drug that doesn't work. That has got to change. And I'll show you why. And then adherence to this outdated claim that there is nothing that will prevent, reverse, or delay Alzheimer's. That's been on all sorts of websites for years and years and years. I hope that will slowly go away uh, because it's simply no longer the case. But that's what you hear from mainstream medicine, unfortunately. And then when you do have someone who progresses, 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 finally goes into a nursing home, well, okay, you certainly wanna make sure that the next generation has no problem, but people come to visit people in nursing homes and no one says, oh my gosh, this is the time. Let's get everybody from the family on active prevention. Why not? That, that's the most important thing you can do when someone is in those late stages. 
get evaluated, get what we call a cognoscopy, and get on active prevention and treatment. Sadly, in the United States, the average cost, by the time someone dies of Alzheimer's disease, the average cost is that the families spend $350,000, and unfortunately that's going up before dying of Alzheimer's. Now, of course, a lot of that is from nursing homes. Nursing homes cost typically $100,000 a year or so. And so over time, you know, the bills really mount, unfortunately. And this leaves many patients and families destitute. So we can do much, much better. That's why it's so, so important that we can say, look, this is no longer a death sentence. Let's get people to get on prevention and earliest treatment and really reduce the global burden of dementia. That's the goal here. And then finally, this insistence on treatment with monopharmaceuticals. Everybody wants a silver bullet. Uh, and as I pointed out, we really want silver buckshot, not a silver bullet. We want to have a bunch of things that together give you the best outcomes. And we've published the best outcomes in the world in terms of actually reversing cognitive decline. So again, we're in an exciting new era. We want to get more people to understand that because there's so much that can be done that couldn't be done even 10 or 15 years ago. Now, I want to show you one slide here on the semantics of what has been called success, because we've all read a lot about the drugs, this new generation, successful drugs. It's a breakthrough. Oh, my gosh, we can finally do something. Well, let's look at what that really means. So here, if you look over to the, the far left here. All right, where are we here? There we go. OK, so if you come over here, you'll see. When you start to develop cognitive decline and you have either a mild cognitive impairment or dementia, on average, you will go downhill at about three and a half points per year. That's on a 30 point scale, such as the so-called MMSE or the MOCA. MOCA stands for Montreal Cognitive Assessment. We use this. It's an easy, fairly quick test. It takes about 12 minutes or so to administer this. And so you're going to lose points each year. That's the natural history of this. Now, if you take one of these antibodies and both of this, aducanumab and lucanumab, have both been approved recently. Donanumab still trying to get them approved. As you can see, they don't make you better. They don't improve your cognition. They don't stabilize you. But what they do in the best case scenario is slightly slow the decline. And as I mentioned earlier, for women, this uh, lecanemab, which is called lecembi, is the trade name, only slows the decline by 11%. It's a tiny, tiny, but you can't really tell the difference. And that's unfortunately associated with a very high cost and with, uh, unfortunately, um, with hemorrhage in, in the brain and in brain uh, edema and things like that. Now, in contrast, the, the trial that we did, and this is freely available online, you can look at it uh, from last year on, in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. This is uh, something called RECODE, which is reversal of cognitive decline. It's the protocol that we developed. Um, you can see people actually got better. And we just submitted a paper. The people who started over a decade ago, many are still better. So this is unprecedented where we're seeing people improve and stay improved. Now, it doesn't happen with everybody. And one of the things we learned is that sometimes people will improve. They will stay improved for several years, and then they'll begin to have some backsliding. When they do that, we find that something new has happened, some new challenge to this energetics and inflammation. And so we have to address those things. And when we do that, they come right back up again. So we have people now that are doing very, very well after more than a decade. Very, very exciting to see. It tells us we're on the right track with understanding this disease. So out of the thousands of patients who've been on the protocol, I just want to show you one here. This is actually a, a patient who's being taken care of by Carrie Mills Rutland, who's in uh, New York, who's a wonderful brain health coach. Um, this is a 65-year-old woman. This is a patient with what's called PCA, posterior cortical atrophy, also known as Benson syndrome. This is one of the presentations of Alzheimer's. So this person has Alzheimer's disease. It's one of the presentations. And in about 5 to 10% of all Alzheimer's patients present with this PCA, posterior cortical atrophy, which means 
Um, there are somewhere around a half a million people, around 500,000 Americans who have this problem. As you can see here, the Mayo Clinic says there are no treatments to cure or slow the progression of posterior cortical atrophy. Well, let me show you one. So here's a woman. You can see back here, uh, she had an MRI, and you can see here her brain has gotten larger. Her gray matter, which is where the neurons live in the brain, has gotten larger. Her hippocampus, which is critical for memory in an area that's heavily affected by Alzheimer's disease, guess what? It's gotten better. Her parietal lobe, which is right back here, which is another area where Alzheimer's strikes, has gotten much better. So you can see her parietal lobe here, which is an area that's typically the, the biggest area affected in PCA. She's gone from less than the first percentile all the way up to the 22nd percentile. And that's been over uh, about a year and a half. You can see her from August 2021 to November of 2022. So just dramatic improvements uh, in her parietal lobe volume. And then you can see her occipital lobe has gone from the 10th, 10.8th percentile to the 25th percentile. In fact, when, when they got the volumetric report on the MRI, uh, they called me at home. I was in the middle of lunch one day, and, I, and they were all—they said they were all jumping up and down in the office uh, when they saw this this woman's improvement in her in her MRI. Very excited. Now, the important thing is, okay, what does this mean for her day-to-day -day function? Well, when she came in, she was unable to read she was able to start reading. And, and by the way, being unable to read is very common with PCA. It's one of the common things. It's a visual perception and analysis problem. So she was able to read once again. When she started, she was unable to use her computer. After the treatment, she's able to use her computer again. She was unable to do brain training exercises. She's able to do brain training exercises once again. So very, very excited about her improvement. And we're seeing improvement in many, many people. But I wanted to give you that uh, example because I think it's such an important one. This is where things are headed. We are in a new world, in a golden age, where more and more people will be able to prevent and reverse their cognitive decline. So I wanna spend just a couple minutes, rather than just telling you what to do, I wanna show you why we do what we do. That's an important thing to see. So I wanna really look under the hood. Let's look at how this actually works. You know, how the sausage is made, as they say. So if you look at the brain, and this is what we spent 30 years in the laboratory doing, if you look to see how does this all work, what you find is something really amazing, actually, that there is a, a switch in your brain, and there are, there are many switches, but this one is very important for your neuroplasticity and very important for your Alzheimer's disease. So what this is depicting here when you see this, so this this thing sticking out here, you can see here this long finger-like thing, that's called a receptor, and it's sitting through, and forgive me, I'm not. I'm gonna try not to mansplain this, so forgive me for this. I'm gonna, this thing goes through the cell, and you can see here outside the cell, it's sticking out, it's looking for something to come bind to it, and then inside the cell, it's gonna signal to the rest of the cell. So it's a little bit like, being able to, to look out of your house and say, aha, the mailman's coming, or aha, this is happening, or that's happening. That's what this receptor does. It samples the outside and notifies the inside. And this green thing you can see here, this is the membrane of the cell. So this is the edge of the cell, just like the, the end of your house. So this is thing you can see here sticking through, it's waiting for things. Now, what's, what's really interesting about this is it really does function like a switch. So when things are are good, guess what happens? Here, there we go. So when things are good, this thing gets cut at a single site and it produces two pieces, one for outside the cell, basically now telling people things are not, things are good here, inside saying to the inside. It's just like sending two memos, one to the public, one inside your company to say things are good. And what I mean by that is, there's enough energetic, there's enough blood flow, enough oxygenation, enough mitochondrial function, not too much toxicity, all these things. Things are good. We're going to be able to grow and maintain. And interestingly, this is very much like what happened with COVID. 
when things are good, you can make connections, you can do things. When things are bad, you go into a protection mode. So this side over here is the connection mode. The other side I'm going to show you is the protection mode. Now, when things are bad, and by the, before I go into the protection mode, let me just say one thing. There are lots of things that cause this cut that you're seeing right here in between the SAPP alpha and the, and the alpha CTF. And one of the things that causes that cut is estradiol. So you can literally trace the molecular pathways as you get the estrogen. It, as you know, it goes into the nucleus and makes uh, hundreds of proteins increase. And one of them is the one that cuts right there and says, things are good. I'm going to be able to make more memories. Now, on the other hand, when things are bad, this same molecule gets cut at three different sites. Now what happens, you have four different little pieces, peptides, SAPP beta, a beta. Well, there's the molecule that we associate with Alzheimer's disease, A beta. That's the amyloid peptide. The third one is JCASP and the fourth one is C31. These are all telling pull back, pull back, we got to go into protection mode. So the A beta that we have vilified in Alzheimer's disease is actually part of your immune system saying, uh-oh, insults have come. We need to switch over into protective mode. And the, the A beta actually kills viruses, kills bacteria, kills some fungi. So it's actually quite a protective molecule. Unfortunately, as with all things, when you're pulling back, you are making, you're making the brain smaller. You're pulling back on the overall network. So this is very much analogous to what happened to our country with COVID-19. Early in 2020, we were told, you got to pull back. You got to socially distance. You got you to gotta, uh, shelter in place. Uh, you've got to not go to work, all this. And what happened? We went into a recession. That's exactly what your brain is doing when it sees these insults, when it sees various bacteria and various uh, problems, metabolic problems, toxin exposure. It goes into this protective mode. And that's what we ultimately see, and we call it Alzheimer's disease, not realizing, yes, it's a much bigger story than just the amyloid. It's your body responding to insults. So we want to get these patients back over to the good side, back over to the connection side, and away from the protection side by getting rid of the problems that are causing it. So what that means, because there are so many things that affect us, all sorts of pathogens, all sorts of toxins, metabolic changes, type 2 diabetes, leaky gut, you know, sedentary lifestyle, all the things we've heard about that increase your risk for Alzheimer's. We initially identified 36 different factors. And so we said, OK, for any patient, they should be aware. It's like having a roof with 36 holes. A drug is a very good patch for one hole, but it, you really have to consider all these things. So therefore, if you wanted to develop the perfect drug for Alzheimer's, and we worked on this for years in the lab when we didn't understand this, we worked on trying to de develop the perfect Alzheimer's drug. Well, guess what it would have to do? That's what it would have to do. It's really a major requirement. It's a tough road for one drug to do all of these things, which is why we argue it's really about determining for each person what's causing it and then addressing those things. So I want to just spend a couple of minutes then before we finish up here and take some questions, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the trial. So we did a clinical trial. We tried for many years, actually, we tried to do the first trial back in 2011 and we got turned down, got turned down numerous times because they said, look, clinical trials should just be about one thing. Just try one thing. And we said, look, that's not the way the disease works. You've got to identify all the things and then you've got to address all the things. And we're really kind of flipping the script instead of with the old-fashioned types of trials, you say ahead of time, this is what we're going to use. We're going to use this drug for everybody. We're going to use this exercise, whatever it is. We said, no, we're going to check each person to see what caused it. We're going to look at all the contributors because people often have 5, 10, or even 15 different things that are contributing. We're going to identify them. We're going to address them. When we do that, people get better. So you can see here this improvement. This is a computer-based scoring 
which is called CNS Vital Signs Neurocognitive Index. And you can see here that people continued to go uphill. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've got people who are now uh, over a decade doing well. Now, you can see here, you'll see a couple of outliers here in this last one, because in between the green and the yellow, guess what happened? The pandemic hit and people said, I'm not going to be doing this anymore. I'm not going to keep up with the stuff you've asked me to do. So we did have a few who actually went downhill. But overall, as a group, they continued to go up, up, up and you know, far better than any other trial. So we're very excited about that. Uh, here's something, you know, it's hard to, to fake your gray matter volume. So when you look at gray matter volumes, what you actually see is they increase in these people. And that's just unheard of. So we see people get better, more gray matter volume, less shrinkage in your hippocampus. So we're very enthusiastic about that. And if you look at their metabolic parameters, it's wonderful. They get better. So this thing at the top here, HSCRP, that's a measure of how inflamed you are. And you can st see statistically significant improvement. Their inflammation went down. Their hemoglobin A1C, which of course is related to prediabetes and diabetes, went down statistically significantly again. Their HOMA IR, which tells you whether you have insulin resistance, went down. Now, that did not reach to a significance because we didn't have data on every single person for their HOMA IR. Nonetheless, you can see it's going in the right direction. And we see this all the time in these people who are treated. Their triglyceride to HDL ratio, that's a very good measure of how much at risk are you for vascular disease got better, again, statistically significant. Their homocysteine, which is a measure of your methylation, and how are you doing with that? Very important for things like detox. This actually got better, again, statistically significant. And then vitamin D levels also went up, as you may have just seen the paper that came out of the UK just yesterday, talking about low vitamin D, as well as 14 other things that they identified from the public health records as being important for young onset uh, Alzheimer's disease. So all of these things are improving. And as the metabolism goes, so goes the brain. So just to summarize here in our trial, which again, you can read it freely available online, the MOCA scores improved, 76% of the people improved their MOCA scores. 84% of the people improved their neurocognitive indices. Subtest, their verbal memories improved, their executive function improved, their psychomotor speed improved, their cognitive flexibility, et cetera, all these improved. AQ20 is actually where you go and you ask the spouse, is this person better or worse? Because in many of these drug trials, even if they get a tiny effect, the spouse can't tell the difference. Well, in this case, the spouse said, oh, yes, they're improved. The vast majority of people improved on what the spouse noticed about them. And then Brain HQ, which is brain training, 100% of them improved on their brain training. As I mentioned on their MRIs, the gray matter volume increased. On the hippocampal volume, there's a normal fall off a little bit for all of us. And these guys had less fall off, even though they had Alzheimer's disease in the, in the relatively early stages, but still had it. Um, they're actually, their hippocampal volume did better than the average person who has no symptoms. So from all of these standpoints, they did very, very well. Now we've published these results in many papers with, as, as Adria said, over 230 published papers. Uh, and we've also published three books, The End of Alzheimer's came out in 2017, End of Alzheimer's Program, and this more recently, The First Survivors of Alzheimer's. And I would challenge anybody, if you read The First Survivors of Alzheimer's, it's seven stories from people from their own their own uh, situation, all the things uh, that happened with them, uh, it, it's hard not to get choked up to hear these people talking. When one, one woman, for example, talked about her grandmother dying of Alzheimer's, then she watched her father, her beloved father, die of Alzheimer's, and then she started getting the symptoms herself. She actually went to a major medical center and they told her, yeah, you're early stages. And she, of course, she looked at her children and said, what am I going to do? Uh, her, it turned out her sister-in-law 
had read one of our papers uh, and started her on our protocol. And she's done very, very well. And she's doing great. And she's now about seven years into this doing very, very well. And knowing that her children are, are not going to have to worry about this. So it, 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 uh, it'll choke you up reading uh, these wonderful stories about people who were told that there was no hope and then did very, very well. So medicine is undergoing a fundamental change. And let's, uh, let's talk about some of the things. The medicine that I learned back in the 20th century was about what is the diagnosis? We learned to make a diagnosis. It's Alzheimer's, it's Parkinson's, it's MS, what have you. But we didn't learn what to do about it. 21st century medicine is about why the diseases occurred, defining these things causally. 20th century medicine, was about pathology. That's how Alzheimer's is defined. You have plaques and tangles in your brain. 21st century medicine is about physiology. It's systems medicine. And that's how the cognitive decline of Alzheimer's has been reversed for the first time. First paper published back in 2014. 20th century medicine was about small data sets, just looking at a few things like your thyroid status, for example, um, often missing the causal factors and then treating with single prescription. It's prescription pad medicine, and it just hasn't worked with these complex illnesses. 21st century medicine is about large data sets, identifying the multiple contributors to disease, and then treating these with personalized protocols. This is truly precision medicine. 20th century medicine was about hopelessness. They just tell you, yeah, you've got Alzheimer's, there's nothing we can do. Whether it's Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia, ALS, frontotemporal dementia, corticobasal degeneration, progressive supranuclear palsy, on and on. There are all these degenerative conditions. As they say, uh, these are the diseases you don't want to die from. And so we can do so much better. 21st century medicine is about the first successes and the first real hope for patients with neurodegenerative diseases. Therefore, I'm really grateful the Pacific Neuroscience Institute is establishing the first program for precision brain health, bringing 21st century approaches to what has been the field of greatest medical therapeutic failure up till now. We are truly witnessing the transformation of neurodegenerative diseases from hopeless to preventable, reversible, and ultimately optional. And for those of us who, wa who want to make this optional, who want to make sure that we don't get this, uh, there are simple ways you can do it. As, as I mentioned, uh, getting a cognoscopy, you can just look up my cognoscopy, or you can look up Dr. Bredesen uh, if, you, if you like, whatever. Get, get Again, I encourage everyone, if you're 40 years of age or, o or over, please, get evaluated, get on active prevention, or if you have symptoms, earliest treatment. Do not wait because it's so much harder the, you know, the, as you wait longer and longer. All right, I wanna just mention here, this is one of my very favorite quotes. This is actually from a rabbi who said, you are not expected to complete your life's work during your lifetime, neither are you excused from it. So, you know, I, I am now, get, I, now getting to my advanced years here, I'm, I'm over 70, and so uh, I know that I'm not gonna be here forever, but my hope is that this will begin, and we've, we've trained over 2,000 physicians to use the protocol that we developed. Many are getting excellent results. Not all, many are. So we wanna keep making the training better and better and better. We wanna keep doing more and more. We have to change the dialogue, change what we're doing, change how we look at these illnesses and encourage people to get on prevention and early treatment so that we can truly you know, tr truly lower the, the global burden of dementia. This is a very exciting time. There are new blood tests for example, that will look very early on. And people say, well, uh, gee, why would I want a blood test to tell me if I'm headed for Alzheimer's? Because you can stop yourself from getting it, that's why. So it's, it's really changing everything we thought we knew about these neurodegenerative conditions with better blood testing, with better precision medicine protocols, uh, with understanding the pathophysiology much better than ever before. There are new tests that you can now look at this in real time. You can do some simple electrophysiological tests to see are things going in the right direction or the wrong direction. We are now in the midst of a larger randomized controlled trial, which is going on at six sites. So I would encourage anyone who lives near those sites 
uh, to, if you're if you're having any issues, check to see if this is right for you. You can actually look up. It's the so-called Evan Thea uh, Dementia Reversal Trial. You'll see there's a website so you can get information on this. Uh, the six sites currently, and these are all with physicians who have had outstanding results. One is in Hollywood, Florida with Dr. Craig Tanio. Another one uh, is in uh, Nashville, Tennessee with Dr. David Hasse. A third one is in Rocky River, just outside of Cleveland, Ohio, with Dr. Nate Bergman. Uh, the fourth one is Dr. Christine Burke, uh, who is uh, over here in Folsom, right near Sacramento. Uh, the fifth one here is uh, Dr. Ann Hathaway, uh, who is here in Marin County. Uh, and then the sixth one is Dr. Kat Toops, who's in the East Bay uh, near San Francisco. So if you know people who live within 60 to 90 minutes uh, of those uh, sites and, and may be interested in being part of the trial, uh, please let us know. You'll see where on the Evanthea Dementia Reversal Trial where you can contact those people. I'm going to stop here uh, to, uh, to allow some time for some questions, uh, and uh, please uh, contact us with any any other issues. I do think uh, you know we're all in this together, and we're now at a time for the first time where we can truly improve cognitive decline. Thanks very much, Adria. Thanks once again for the for the wonderful. Uh, for the the wonderful honor of speaking to your group here. My goodness gracious. Thank you for speaking so quickly. You knew how short the time was here. If you need a sip of water before I ply you with questions, please go. All good. Thank you. Whole series of questions, actually. Okay. I recall you in our many conversations, we were talking about exercise and nutrition. I seem to recall that you uh, conglomerated into maybe seven points. Yeah. One of my objectives always for the almost 20 years I've been with Commonwealth is to make sure that our listeners and attendees are empowered yes. in their own environment. So that would be my first question to you. Can you please enumerate that seven so Absolutely. that people can have it? And let me make one more comment to our audience. You, He covered so much information, Dr. Bredesen did. Within two weeks, you'll be able to find this YouTube again to listen to on the Commonwealth Club website. You can listen to it. You can share it. You can get the names of the people he was addressing. You can get the names of the test. And we'll, we'll go over a little bit more of that. So don't, don't be anxious. Stress is harmful. He's going to answer your you know, approximately seven now, and then we'll go to other questions. Very good point. Thank you, Adria. So there are seven basics that we can all do, which all, and they all address this, they improve the energy, they lower the, the, uh, the, the, the problem with respect to inflammation. And then for each person, you want to look at specifics, but the seven basics, diet, exercise, and I'll talk about each one, what's important about it. So diet, exercise, sleep, stress, brain training, detox, and some targeted supplements. Those are the basics. We can all do those. They will help to reduce our risk and help actually to improve our cognition. So when it comes to diet, the diet that has worked best for cognition is a plant-rich, doesn't have to be only plants. We use you know, pastured chicken, pastured eggs, uh, uh, wild-caught fish, uh, grass-fed beef. These things are all fine. So plant-rich, though, uh, mildly ketogenic diet. Uh, we call it KetoFlex 12-3. You can actually now get, you can actually get these delivered uh, very simply. Uh, Nutrition for Longevity, I give them great credit. They really worked hard to make these. I've, I've had them delivered and eaten them myself. They're, they're wonderful. So get a plant-rich, mildly ketogenic diet. For exercise, it turns out to be helpful to do different ones, to do some aerobics. And you want to get, you know, if you can, five days a week at least, some aerobics, some strength training, because they have complementary mechanisms, some speed and some coordination. So, you know, that's why people say, go out and do some ballroom dancing and do some ping pong and things like that. These are all good for your brain and for your synapses. And then sleep. And sleep is one of the most important ones. And the, this is where the wearables are really helping. If you like your an Oura Ring or an Apple Watch or a Fitbit or Garmin or any of these things, you can track yourself. I check myself every night. You want to get seven to eight hours of sleep. You want to get at least one hour of deep sleep because that's a very good time for detoxing. And you want to get at least an hour and a half of REM sleep. So this all of the sleep, very, very helpful for your brain. In fact, 
Alzheimer's tends to hurt your sleep and your sleep tends to enhance Alzheimer's. So there's this terrible, vicious uh, circle here once you start to to uh, go away from good sleep. You want to make sure that, that your oxygenation is good also. So if you haven't checked your oxygenation while you're sleeping, get an oximeter very inexpensively or get a sleep, just have your doctor do a sleep study. Make sure that you, you're not dropping your, your oxygen status. The, the typical reason, of course, is because of sleep apnea. And many people don't realize they have it. One of the patients, by the way, who did well for six years and then had some fall off, we found out what was causing it. And now she's doing great once again, had three new things. And one of them was severe sleep apnea that had been undiagnosed, unfortunately. So you address those, things get better. And then stress. Sorry, go ahead, Adria. Stress, we can talk about that for 14,000 years. Yep. But thank you for that. Is there, I'm gonna have to um, give you a lot of quick questions. Okay. Does one of your books list or does your website list these different practitioners you mentioned? Yes, the website lists, lists the practitioners, yeah. Your website name is? Yeah, uh, you can get there simply by, the probably the easiest way um, is look at CQ test, CQ test. So you want to know how you're doing cognitively. You can also go to, uh, as I mentioned, mycognoscopy.com, or you can go to apollohealthco.com. So I've been working with Apollo for a number of years. Fantastic group. Um, this is Lance Kelly and his team. Uh, they come from uh, Apple. A number of them, including Lance, uh, come from Apple. And really, this is the future to bring what's needed in healthcare together with digital technology so we can do better at diagnosis, better understanding. I mean, look what chat GPT is doing for the world right now. As we understand these things better, as we get more insight, there has to be a much better relationship between the digital world and the health world. We, we need very much to be about well care. I yes. love, you, say, you know, we're talking about underlying causes totally because I, I totally, I'm an integrative cancer consultant. I talk about sleep. I talk about nutrition. What you said about causes is so fundamental. Sleep, mm -hmm. I, I tell people, you know, because you're talking about sleep, take your cell phone away from your head. It can be over in the bathroom. If it's an emergency, it's still going to ring. You can set your phone so that your priority people can get through even if your phone sound is off you know shut, uh, unplug everything you don't need a tv in your bedroom let that environment be as peaceful as possible go to sleep with the circadian rhythms i'm emphasizing sleep because sleep is when our bodies heal that's when we relax that's when we can really support detoxification it's one of your basics it's one of my basics right. it's absolutely essential shut all the overhead lights we don't need to have our adrenals go into the second phase Try to work with the lights of nature and get your sleep and everything else is going to function better. You'll be able to absorb a lot more of what Dr. Uh, Bredesen is talking about when your brain is functioning better, when you've got re reasonably good rest. Uh, another quick question, and I am going to have to wind up the program in a few minutes. How does this protocol help Parkinson's? Or does it? Yeah, great point. So we have uh, adapted this for each of the different neurodegenerative diseases. We've already had some good uh, fortune with the first few people with Lewy body disease and also with dry macular degeneration. So that's one of the reasons to set up this new program. With Parkinson's, you have to adapt it for the different, each one has different pathophysiology. Parkinson's, interestingly, turns out to have a lot of toxicity associated with it. So the protocol as it is, it was developed for Alzheimer's. Um, it can help Parkinson's, but you really want to use the Parkinson's version of this. Okay. And how do we establish a baseline to monitor? Let's say we're in our home environment. Is yeah. there a way to do that? Or is there someplace reasonably inexpensively since healthcare supposedly insurance? Well, that's a good question. Does yeah. insurance cover any of this? Yeah, insurance covers some of the tests, but not all of the tests. And it's really unfortunate because I, I think that, you know, the, the the answer has always been, well, you know, we don't care about your future. We only care about you now. So we're not going to cover these things, uh, which is really unfortunate. We, as you said, we need to get more well care. And yes, so you can do, it's actually relatively inexpensive. Um, again, go on mycognoscopy.com, get the basic tests uh, and, or get on, you know, do my, uh, or do a CQ test to see whether you're more for recode, which is reversal, or precode, which is prevention. Um, we'd like to see more people doing recode because it's a more extensive evaluation. But even that, um, yes, you're going to pay 
something like uh, $800 or something to get all these tests. It's a lot of tests because they're actually telling you the things you need to know. Um, you're going to save many, many, many times that by knowing what you need to know and addressing those things. Okay. So there is a sensitive issue here because breast cancer is also so prominent. Yeah. yeah. Those hormone driven cancers also affect men with prostate cancer and it goes to brain cancer and ovarian cancer and all these yeah. other cancers. Um, how important is it to address hormone therapy as part of your protocol? Do we start with the first seven? Do we see how people relate? Where, where does that weigh in? Because my concern is that people will just say, oh, I'll just go get, you know, hormone therapy and forget the rest. Right. That's so important. So first of all, yes, start with the first seven. Don't do that. Give yourself six months on those because, you know, these, these changes have been going around for a while. So it's going to take several months to turn the ship around. And then after six months, see where you're doing. Talk to your practitioner about whether that's something. And if you're going to consider bioidentical hormone therapy, and it should be bioidentical, talk to an expert. And, and, and there, as you say, this is not black and white. You know, just like vaccination is not black and white. There are lots of issues on all sides. Same thing for BHRT. And yes, if you've had breast cancer before or a hormone dependent cancer, a hormone responsive cancer, of course, that's a strike against doing it. Um, although some people still decide, look, I want my brain. Um, but if you haven't had that, of course, you want to keep up with things like whether you like sonocene, you know, ultrasound, uh, whatever you like to do for e evaluation to make sure that you don't develop a cancer. So, yes, this is something that it's important to weigh, uh, but start with the other things first and then think about it down the road. Thank you for that. Also, there is the wisdom of other cultures. In our society, we tend to be a Band-Aid culture, right? Yeah. We don't necessarily get to causes. And I loved your example. What I generally say to patients referred to me is, imagine there's a dike holding back a bunch of water and every health issue you've got, you plug up that leak. And eventually yeah. you're plugging up so many leaks instead of getting to the cause, the source of the water, that the dike, the person falls down or the brain has all these issues. The yeah. wisdom of other cultures, Chinese medicine says the adrenals is where you start to support your hormones and your thyroid, right? So we, we can go in other directions. Thermography monitors um, the blood supply to any tumor growth. So we don't necessarily have to do it with an x-ray, which catches it with radio afterwards or a mammogram. We can check it perhaps with thermography. Yeah. Anyway, this has don't been- Don't forget the gut. The gut is one of the most important. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And the support of the gut, which is the gut brain connection, which leads to our intuition, which leads to our feel good hormones, which lowers our stress when we're supporting our gut. Right. And eating, you know, eating properly and getting sufficient rest and not overdoing it and exercise. We're such a society of overdoers. Yep. Um, Dr. Bredesen, this has been absolutely extraordinary. We have raced through the questions. I have a page and a half of more questions. Um, hopefully people can get your books yeah. and they can answer a lot more of their questions in hopefully less than two weeks. The Commonwealth Club will have this presentation on its website so they can share it with other people. They can dialogue with other people after they watch it. They can relearn everything you've taught us. I'm about to close this program. Very, very grateful for your sharing your wisdom. You are an international expert and thank you so much for the courage to go outside the box and really stand up for what you believe in. Everything synergizes, the body is complex, we can't just shoot it with one thing or another, it doesn't work, and you've proven that with your results. I'm Absolutely. closing the program with the Commonwealth Club of California. Thank you all for being here. For those members who are joining us in the next half hour in a more intimate meeting with Dr. Bredesen, please go to the link you were emailed and we'll see you there. We welcome you all here. Bye now.